<laughs> yeah, uh, this session, as uh, you see in the program, is on the multi-dimensional poverty in Africa. And uh, to chair this session, we have uh, uh, Dr. Willen Johnson, a friend of the Institute. She's done lots of work for us. Uh, she is an economic consultant uh, in finance and development. Uh, and uh, she has done many, many important things, including having been uh, the US uh, director on the Africa Development Bank. Uh, she was also uh, worked uh, extensively with the Federal Reserve uh, Bank system. Uh, so uh, Dr. Johnson will be presiding over this session. So thank, thank you. you very much, Professor Ndulu. It is certainly an honor to be here. Always wonderful to be back at Cornell, but especially an honor to uh, be participating in this seminar that has been inspired and continues to be inspired by the work of Professor Thorbeck. I am glad that we started off with uh, such a stimulating keynote speech because the presentation uh, really relates to work that I've been doing in terms of banking in Africa and more recently in, with the Grameen Foundation, there is an effort to measure poverty, and they have a progress out of poverty index. And certainly many of us have benefited from the index that, that, that Professor Thorbeck himself developed. But what we will be discussing in this panel is the measurement of poverty in a way that we hope will provide some guidance for the types of interventions that may be useful to alleviate it. Um, Professor Ndulu referred to The Economist. The Economist must have known we were going to have this panel. And just last week, they had an article on the multi-dimensional poverty measures that have been developed at Oxford. Um, one of our speakers will be from there, but our first speaker is uh, Professor James Foster, who will speak about multi-level development goals. I will simply present the names of the speakers and then allow them to come up uh, because you have their bios. And I think we're even more interested in what they have to say than um, the titles or institutional affiliations that they have. But following <coughs> Professor Foster will be Sabina Alkire, who comes to us from the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative that I just mentioned. And the last speaker is Stephen Younger, who is in Ithaca, an economist in residence at the Department of Economics of Ithaca College. So I'd like to very quickly turn over the microphone to James Forster. Well, it's really great back to be back here at Cornell. I spent uh, four glorious years here many years ago with uh, the likes of Eric Thorbeck and Gary Fields, my own advisor, Mukul Majumdar, I see in back Henry Wan. It's just uh, exciting to, to come back to a place that I'm so familiar with, and it's uh, such a, a fine part of my life, uh, uh, in fact, that which led to where we are right, my, where I am right now in my work, my research. So thank you all for, for the contributions you've made over the years to me. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, a way of thinking about development goals. You know, we're in that post-2015 sense of things right now. Everyone's saying we ought to measure this, do that. And so the substance of my talk today will concern not which indicators are the right ones and all of that, but just how we might take it all and put it together to make better sense of what there is out there. And also I want to make a comment about what there isn't out there, which is the adequate 
data that would allow us to conclude anything over time and space about development. Uh, so the themes today, development, measurement, and then some examples to show how the measurement approach might actually be brought to bear in this context. Well, we know that there's many sources of data that lead into the MDGs, uh, census, survey, administrative data, but there's a lot of data problems. Uh, for over 35% of countries, no trend data on two-thirds of the MDG indicators. This is jarring for almost half of Sub-Saharan Africa. There's no household income or expenditure survey in more than five years. Uh, this may change, but as of right now. For 19 countries in East Asia and the Pacific in 2011, data on 125 a day poverty was lacking in all 19. Data on malnutrition was available for just one. And as of 2011, almost half of the 163 countries did not have a data point on both sides of 2,000 with respect to undernutrition of children. Uh, Francois Bourguignon, who's a good friend to many of us here, Gary, co-author, and uh, has uh, you know, a really interesting discussion of what we should be doing uh, with the next round, said, improving data gathering and its quality in all countries should be the central focus of this process for this time frame in the last few years and beyond. Uh, the need to improve the quality and research, uh, reach of household surveys is urgent, MDG's report in 2012. And the implications of not having these data are just straightforward in terms of credibility. An MG, uh, as a tool for public information, an MD, MDG report cannot compromise on the quality of data. Its credibility depends to a large extent on the reliability of the information. This goes without saying, but I just want to reiterate it because we often uh, don't emphasize it in fora like this. Uh, and accountability, credibility and accountability. Accountability can be further limited by a lack of data to indicate which of the MDGs are off track and which bottleneck solutions are working properly. Without such indicators, the monitoring units do not have the required capacity to hold parties accountable. Millennium Acceleration Framework, December 2011. So obviously, I think when you're talking measurement, you really do want to say up front that one part of any proposal for 2015 and beyond should first and foremost start off with data. So, a proposal here might be to improve data frequency and quality by investing in a pilot survey for baseline, raise a regular one-hour household poverty survey with key indicators and space for individual national additions that might augment based on local priorities. And in fact, this could decrease the actual cost of providing information because right now it's willy-nilly being gathered from here and from there and contractors are being paid. If you're all done up front, you know, ahead of time from you know, one source, it could actually be cheaper to go this route. All right, so that being said, let's talk now about measurement. Well, measurement is of course the lens through which progress is revealed. Currently, we have this dashboard of indicators that indicate you know, what, where things are, what our goals are. There's no summary measure at all. And the justification for leaving it in dashboard form is like most of the time when we have dashboards. Well, we can't really put together apples and oranges. Okay? But there's tremendous drawbacks of dashboards. Uh, as com communications instruments, one frequent criticism is they lack what has made GDP a success, the powerful attraction of a single headline figure, allowing simple comparisons of performance. And this is from the stiglitz sen Fatusi uh, report. And I want to emphasize this is not just marketing. This is what really facilitates engagement monitoring, good governance, and accountability. 
is if people can actually communicate about something they hold in common, such as a headline figure. And there's a good discussion of this in Duncan Green's blog uh, with respect to traction. How do you actually take and hold countries accountable and other people accountable? And to do so through league tables, where you actually put on the performance of countries in a region, and they can compare once, one against the other. Dashboards are notoriously bad for coordination. They preserve all sorts of silos and inhibit communication about synergies and trade-offs. There are really important synergies among the MDGs. The acceleration of one goal often speeds up progress in another. In households where women are illiterate, child mortality is higher, implying links between education, empowerment of women, and the health of children. Given these synergistic and multiplier effects, all the goals need to be given equal attention and achieved simultaneously. This requires, as Eric has said many times, multi-sectoral approaches and coordination among various implementing agencies. This is from UNDP report in 2010. So I'm thinking perhaps there is room for some new instruments to be used in the context of the post-2015 discussion. Maybe these instruments might, in fact, identify and prioritize individuals or households or regions that are multiply deprived with overlapping deprivations. Maybe they could be aggregated and disaggregated, disaggregated to any population level that's needed for the type of policy that's being evaluated. That could offer high-level summary indicator for communication and monitoring in conjunction with dimensional indicators that would facilitate deeper policy analysis and coordination. So hence the multi-level development measurements can be transparently tailored by countries themselves or by localities within countries to fit local policy needs for greater ownership and for greater traction, and might be able to apply to the type of data we actually see out there, these categorical, ordinal data, where you really can't say how far the progress is moving except in a kind of ordinal way. If you can incorporate all of these desiderata into a new instrument, wouldn't it be useful? Maybe there is a good reason for proceeding along this line. Of course, before, there really was no such instrument available as far as I could see. Hence, it wasn't implemented at all. Well, it turns out that many countries have been exploring new types of, of technologies for poverty measurement. Beginning with Mexico in 2006, and these new technologies, I think, <coughs> can be incorporated quite nicely in this context. So the question that I'd like to start now is to pull us back into poverty measurement and say, hey, how can we evaluate poverty when there's many variables or dimensions of well-being to look at? The background papers for this part of the discussion are given here, co-authored papers with Sabina, Sabina and actually uh, we're missing a few here, but there's, there's a number of them with various co-authors. And the application to MDGs, Alkai and Sumner, paper a long time back with <laughs> a few years back with Sabina. And then perhaps the most interesting new discussion, Duncan Green's entry in his blog, at last a sensible proposal for post-2015. Have a look. All right, the methodology AF for Alkire Foster emulating FGT has two parts to it. First, identifying the poor. Any poverty measurement technology has two parts to it. Identifying the poor and aggregating across the data to obtain an overall indicator of poverty. The way we identify the poor is by means of a dual cutoff system. You have many dimensions 
in which you could be deprived. Mm -hmm. Each one of those has its own cutoff. Okay? So that's the first type of cutoff. The second cutoff is the poverty cutoff, by which you see how intense the deprivations are in breadth, if you will. How many deprivations do you have? Many? You're multiply deprived, multiply deprived enough, you're considered poor, and there's another cutoff called the poverty cutoff. Identification. Aggregation is done by means of an adjusted FGT. I'll focus primarily on the simple one here, the adjusted headcount ratio, not the gap equivalent and the FGT equivalent. But it turns out that the adjusted headcount in this case is actually somewhat analogous to a gap measure, where the gap is now in terms of breadth, not depth. The key measure is this adjusted headcount ratio, called M0 here. It's the headcount times a measure of intensity. H is the share of population defined as poor, or the incidence, the headcount ratio. And A is the average breadth, or multiplicity of deprivation people suffer at the same time, the intensity of poverty. All of this crucially relies on having data on the joint distribution. To know if you're multiply deprived, of course, I need to know whether you are deprived in more things at once, and many things at once. I can't simply use you know, data on education here, health here, income here. That's anonymous. I have to be able to take a look at a person or a family or if we go up the ladder of aggregation to a region, a village, and see how that unit is multiply deprived. So a joint distribution is crucial for this approach. The concept is poverty as multiple deprivations. And this is very similar to notions, intuitive notions, that are used by NGOs like BRAC. And as I said, it obviously depends on the joint distribution. It can be used with ordinal data. Dirt floors are fine to be part of the data, dirt versus covered floors. And the whole point of this is really to convert this qualitative data into a very simplified quantitative form, a kind of dichotomized form that can then be aggregated to obtain an overall indicator. Once you've done this, you have an indicator that's really quite transparent. It's defined by what variables you use, the deprivation cutoffs, the deprivation values. Well, it may be the case, like Mexico, that you would say income is half as important. It's, it's equally as important as all the social variables. So we'll split it in half with income given equal weight as all the other variables. So that could be the case. Once you've decided what the values of each deprivation would be, and you can transmit that information to someone else who can use those to construct the same index. Continuing, you must know the poverty cutoff as well as the deprivation cutoffs, deprivation values, and variables. Once you have all of that, you can take the book, hand it to someone else, they can calculate it themselves. In fact, they can calculate it and perform robustness exercises to see if you did it right to see if maybe a little change would change things. It's hard to do that with dollar a day, because a lot of the intuitive part is in the construction of the variable consumption itself, or income. So that robustness is a little tougher to do there. It can be replicated, as I said, and tested for robustness. It can also be implemented at a whole lot of different levels. Cross-country, this so-called multi-dimensional poverty index of the UNDP. It's been in the Human Development Report since 2010. Then within countries, the adoption by Mexico as its official poverty technology in, what was it, 2009? Colombia, very more recently. El Salvador is en route to doing it, and a host of other countries. And within countries, states, Two states in Brazil have adopted it as the official way of evaluating poverty. Local village level, this can be implemented quite simply as a participatory exercise and has been implemented and 
Dominican Republic, India, Bhutan, many exercises. People understand it. They get it. What's important to you in terms of poverty? Here are the dimensions. What qualifies as being not deprived or being deprived? Cutoffs. All right, how much deprivation does it really take to be poor? Chuck. More recently, as a coordination tool, this has been used in Colombia. And this was a real innovation that struck me and Sabina as being something we hadn't thought about before, but which was a very practical use of this. That the committee of ministers of finance, of education, of health, all attend a committee, a, a meeting on a regular basis with the president. And they discuss poverty alleviation in the context of this measure. And they see how their, each of their contributions is affecting things. Okay, so there's a feedback among different parts of what usually is a very siloed exercise in this country and others. So the measure itself is a coordination tool for getting ministries to work together toward one end. And it's also been used and is being used in constructing other measures. You may have heard of the Gross National Happiness Index in Bhutan. In fact, it is built using this technology. Uh, Sabine Halakai has contributed greatly to this exercise. Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index by Feed the Future Initiative in DC. Um, USAID, IFPRI put in their OFI. It's an index trying to get to the idea of how empowered are women in making agriculture decisions, in decisions in the household over the types of technology, what to do with money, how free they have in terms of time, all aggregated to an index representing empowerment, then also comparing across the genders. Service delivery performance measures by a student of mine named Melanie Alwine and myself. You can evaluate the multiple dimensions of good or poor service delivery with the same approach. If you're doing poorly in too many dimensions, then overall you're considered to be not performing well. And then finally, measures of corruption in the pretty recent World Bank Economic Review, related measures built on a related structure. So let me just give a quick review of something you probably know well, unidimensional poverty measurement. There's income seven, three, four, eight, poverty line is five. The deprivation vector says, who's poor? Give them a one. Who's not? Give them a zero. So we can tell that seven is not poor, put a zero. Three and four, put a one, and so on. This deprivation vector is the basis of the headcount ratio. Take its mean, add up the entries, divide by the number of people, and that's the percentage of people who are poor. Likewise, if you look at a, a gap measure, that would be the poverty line minus the achieved value over the poverty line. That's the normalized gap. For people who are poor, the rest of the people, it's still zero. So the first person, the last person are not poor in this case, they have zero. But the second person, poverty line is five, the achievement is three, five minus three is two, over five, two-fifths. That's the normalized gap. You can see the next person is one-fifth. It turns out if you take the mean or the average of this vector, that's the so-called per capita poverty gap, the second measure of our class of measures. Continuing on, you might want to emphasize the poorest of the poor. If you do, then the FGT type squared gap approach, pioneered with Eric, Joel Greer, could square these gaps. So instead of two-fifths, it's four twenty-fifths. Four twenty one-fifth, it's one twenty-fifth. Now look at the ratio between those two numbers. In one case, it's one to four, but now it's one to 16. No, in one case, it's one to two. In the second case, it's one to four. Apologies. And so you're emphasizing this distinction between the people who are quite poor and those that are just a little poor. Average that up, and you have the FGT measure that we were talking about earlier. 
So this is the pantheon of uh, single dimension measures very frequently used. And I think that the main reason why they're used so frequently is that they can be decomposed by population subgroups. It's extremely helpful to do so. Okay, in the multidimensional case, everything is analogous. So let me run you through this. Here's a matrix of achievements. You have domains, people. The first one might be income in dollars per day. The second could be years of education. Third, self-reported health. The final, whether you have access to service. Cutoffs, $13 a day, 12, 3, 1. I'll just, it seems intuitive. You have to achieve uh, for the context that we're looking at here, say US environment, 12 years of education is constitute, you know, if you don't have that, you're deprived. Uh, Self-reported health, if it's poor, right, or fair, then it's considered to be, you're considered to be deprived. James, and if, excuse me, I think you misspoke. You said dollars down there. You didn't mean dollars, you meant years of education. Oh, that? yes, actually 12 is years of education, but 13 can be dollars a day. Okay. Yeah, okay, sure, sorry. So here's the data. Here are the cutoffs, deprivation-wise. These are the ones that fall below the cutoffs the ones with a line underneath them. So those are the ones we'll be concentrating on. In fact, we could do the same thing we did before with the deprivation vector. Now we have zeros and ones. One if deprived, zero if not in that dimension. So this gives us a very compact way of saying who's deprived and in what. We might want to ask who's poor? Well, one way of thinking about who's poor is in terms of how many deprivations the person has. So I've given you that count of deprivations to the right-hand side. Zero for the first person, two for the second, four. Uh, yes, zero, two, four, one. Who's poor? Well, let's go back one second. I think the first person's probably not. Not deprived in anything. I think the last person, uh, the third person, is probably poor. It's the other two that we're kind of concerned about here. And so our approach is to say, you know, we should pick some cutoff that prioritizes the people who are the most poor and leave people, let's say, having one deprivation as not being in the first group priority. That's the way we're identifying who is poor. It's a little bit crude, but it's a way of moving forward. Under this definition, if a person has two or more deprivations, you're considered to be poor. So that leaves person two and person four being poor, but the final one not. These are the people who are most multiply deprived. The next step, aggregation. Aggregation. We begin by censoring out the person who isn't poor, and we take the incidence and imagine, could that be a good way of measuring poverty in this world? Maybe not. Because it turns out that if you were to increase the deprivation of person two, you wouldn't see that reflected at all. So to incorporate this notion of intensity of poverty, we include more information. And that's on the deprivation share of each person. Two-fourths, four-fourths, Average intensity is three-fourths. We then multiply that times the headcount ratio to obtain M0, thank you, the adjusted headcount ratio. And it turns out to be the mean of this matrix. So just like with the single dimension approach, it's obtained by taking an average of the matrix. Sum up the entries, divide by the total number. Okay, this uses all the information here you've heard before except there's an analogy between this new measure and the poverty gap measure. One of the key aspects of this measure is that you can actually decompose it again into the dep deprivational contributions to poverty, thus allowing policy to be guided by how much deprivations in a particular dimension are impacting poor people. The MPI, so what we have here is a headline for communications and monitoring but we can also break it down into a coordinated dashboard that's coordinated with the headline for understanding better what's going on. An example, number one, 
MPI, 10 indicators. You probably have seen this before, but I'll just mention into three different dimensions and then down into 10 indicators, health, education, living standard. Differential values in proportion to the areas of the little uh, rectangles. Uh, a person is considered to be deprived, if, uh, to be poor if deprived in at least 33% at the same time. The MPI, multidimensional poverty index, is an M0 measure. It's head incidence times intensity. Here's an example from the recent uh, human development report. We can see that with the black dots being 125 a day, the bars are giving incidence of MPI, and the colors are giving intensity of the people within the bars. Okay, so you can have a t uh, an idea here is that we have some rather general relationship between these two ways of measuring poverty, but still quite ragged. They're measuring rather different things. Okay. <coughs> All right. And within countries, we can see this is Ethiopia, Niger, Mali, okay. throughout. Go over this. So within countries, in Africa, you can also take it down to the local levels, as is done in this graph. You can evaluate trends over time. And here's an example of Nigeria. Overall, this is the picture, but the two regions, south-south, has a very different decrease in deprivation. It's negative, means de decreasing deprivations. Over here, we have some of them actually rising including electricity, nutrition, increased deprivation in this region. Example for coordination. This is Colombia's index, and here's the picture that I promised you. That is from the website of Colombia, the ministers getting together with the president to talk over what's happening with poverty. Mexico. Here's their measure. Income and social rights are given equal weights. This goes automatically, I apologize. That was very quick, wasn't it? But the main thing I wanted you to see was this, that during the crisis, 2008, 2010, poverty rose in Mexico. But the government could say, look, we're doing our work in the social sphere. Here is what we've done. We brought this down, down, down. Obviously, we're not succeeding as well, because obviously, unemployment hurts food security a great deal. And that's what's been happening during this time. And also, it hurts the income side of things. So they could explain to the population and get on with it. And the population could then understand and say, yes, this makes sense. The government is doing the right policies at this time. Finally, the women's empowerment measure, but I don't have time to really get into it. I'll just say that it's now rolled out in three countries, going to be rolled out in 16. It's already? 16 out of the 19. 16 out of the 19. Uh, update, update. Mm -hmm. So remember my proposal. I wanted to design a multidimensional instrument that could do this, identify and prioritize individuals, households or regions with overlapping deprivations be aggregated or disaggregated to any population level, offer a high level summary indicator, and lower levels analytical indicators to see what's really causing the problem, can be transparently tailored by countries to fit their own circumstances and compared to a standard at the international or global level, and something that really applies to the type of data we have available. Thank you. <laughs>